said, we are very blessed to have an affiliate like RCAP uh, on the national issues. And we are, we are coincidal with one another. And we're also very fortunate to have the president of RCAF living in our great state. So I'd like to introduce Brett Kenzie at this time. Good morning. Yeah, I'm Brett Kinsey. My brother and I ranch down in South Central South Dakota. George is on the stock growers board, so he's also involved. Uh, part of the bargain is you get either he or I, and today you lost. So, um, yeah, I just, I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate the stock growers for putting this together and trying and giving people who want to know what's going on and, and to take part in their government of by and for the people requires the people, right? It's on us. We can't blame it all on DC. And, and that's why I'm just always so happy to be in front of people like you. Uh, so our calf is here today to update you on what's going on. Bill's going to speak a little bit after a while, but we do have some board members that made the trip out here because they so appreciate being in South Dakota, the South Dakota stock growers. Um, I'll just start over here. Eric Nelson from Mobile, Iowa. He's our vice president of RCAF USA. Um, again, Bill, you're going to get to see him, so you know him. We've got Eric Groper from Long Valley. And uh, Dave Hyde right here. He's kind of inconspicuous, so he's hard to spot in the crowd. And is that it for my board members? I don't think Judy's here today. She was here last night, so we were glad for that. One other person I'd like to point out is Mike Calicrate. He's been at this as long as almost anybody. So it's pretty awesome that he can come down from Colorado. He's, uh, he's a guy that didn't follow the herd, but he still, he still cares about the herd. So I, I mean, I don't know how else to put that. You know, a guy that's, uh, he's direct marketing, but he knows the value of the competitive market that we all seek. And man, that's, that's pretty awesome stuff. Um, I guess with that, again, we're happy to be here with the stock growers. Our calf is all these board members that I mentioned, they're cattlemen just like you. That's what keeps our policy closest to the cattlemen and working for the cattlemen. And, and I'm just delighted that our policy lines up so well with stock growers policy. Honestly, sometimes stock growers issues lead us to make policy and perhaps it works in, in the opposite sometimes too. So working together on things like MCOOL, that 5014 resolution brought to light just how thin our cash markets have gotten and we've continued to erode since that resolution. Check off all these issues that you're going to hear more about later. So with that, I guess, are we going to roll in and I get to introduce Jim Mundorf, correct? This is a pretty special treat for me. I've gotten to know Jim here over the last few years. Jim is something America desperately needs more of, and that's an independent journalist that will dig in and research something that he thinks isn't quite right. Uh, I appreciate that he will state a fact as a fact and not be afraid to state that fact, and he will sometimes state his opinion because we use facts to try and figure out where things are going. But he will state an opinion as an opinion so that we can think about it and we can decide. But he's uh, doing crit critical work in the area of this globalism and radical climate business <laughs> that we see going on. It's the hottest topic going. So with that, I'd like you to welcome Jim and he'll be able to tell you more about him and his family. So, pull this out of here. Brett's a little closer to it than I am. Um, I want to thank you guys for having me um, to come talk to you. And I think the main reason that I got invited was because of the work I'm doing on, or I did on um, what's called the USDA's Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities Project. Um, I wrote something and did a video, um, which is what I do occasionally. but. As I was digging through that thing, I kept seeing uh, how it kept saying how cattlemen can be part of the solution, or farmers and agriculture can all be part of the solution. And one of the things I didn't see, and I thought, all the, there's all this solution talk, but there's there's no they're not really ever saying what the problem is. Um, 
and as you dig through it and you realize that it's a three billion dollar system it's three billion dollars that the USDA took um, with no oversight and they're what they want to do with it is build a system that measures your carbon emissions um, and so they're kind of giving away what the problem is there the problem is you and your carbon emissions um, and all the bigwigs in agriculture have pretty much signed on to this deal and that that narrative that carbon emissions are this huge problem um, and when you get down to it the problem is you and they're not going to tell you that but um, John Kerry will and he said um, he had a speech that a lot went out and a lot was on has been seen on social media a lot um, and has been condemned by all these same bigwigs in agriculture that have signed on to this deal but in his speech he said agriculture contributes about 33 percent of all the emissions in the world and we can get to net zero we can't get to net zero we don't get this job done unless agriculture is front and center as part of the solution you just can't continue to both warm the planet while also expecting to feed it it doesn't work so we have to reduce emissions from the food system um, and that that speech and video has been out and, and shared a lot um, on social media but one thing they don't tell you is who he was talking to when he gave that speech and that speech was um, at the USDA he was invited to give us to speak to the uh, US Department of Agriculture where he came and kind of condemned agriculture um, farmers and ranchers and I have another quote here for you um, a senior UN, a senior United Nations environmental official says entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. He said governments have a 10 year window of opportunity to solve the greenhouse effect before it goes beyond human control. June 29th, 1989. And I was 10 years old when that, that was said. Uh, that's from an AP news story. And so that's what I grew up with. Um, I grew up in the 90s, and Al Gore was a vice president, and that's the, the message I heard on throughout the media was the world would be unrecognizable before I was able to buy beer legally. Um, but I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and uh, we were those one of those farmer feeders that are going extinct. Um, we had a couple couple lots there and we were able to feed out about 300 head of cattle and we raised everything um, everything we fed we pretty much grew ourselves and right across the fence from the cattle we chopped alfalfa and chopped corn and um, and that's how we fed the cattle and we had a we blew it up into these nice big blue harvest stores and the guy that lived there before us built a real nice place and then my dad bought it from the bank in the mid 80s which is kind of a common story back then. But um, when you run that kind of operation, you always have stuff to fix, I feel like. And uh, my dad likes working on stuff, so we fix pretty much everything ourselves. And so he built himself in a real nice shop, and that's where I learned how to hold a flashlight and hand him tools, and I got real good at sweeping the floor. But um, Spent a lot of time up in that shop, and in the, in the shop there was a real familiar voice that back in the 90s, and I think he was found in a lot of shops, and his name was Rush Limbaugh. And I don't really care what anybody thinks about Rush Limbaugh, I'm just here to kind of tell you what his message was at the time. At the time that I was hearing that the world would be unrecognizable, he was telling, he was saying that um, global warming was a man, was a, uh, created to control every aspect of your life. And, um, and so there I am as a kid, hearing these two messages, wondering you know, how this whole deal is gonna play out. And here we are 30 years later. Um, on the one hand, you have the world did not end. The world is not unrecognizable and countries have not been wiped off the face of the earth. But to go back to John Kerry, in 2009, he said, scientists have predicted by 2014 the Arctic would be ice-free. And we would have a polar summer. We would have summertime in the Arctic. And I haven't been up there, but I don't think that that has happened. 
But to go back to his speech he gave to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, he said, everything the scientists have been telling us will happen for 30 years now is happening, but bigger and faster than predicted. And you wonder what kind of guy can say those things after, you know, 10 years ago he said the Arctic would be ice free. And now he says the predictions are happening faster. And so that's what you have on the one hand of the climate alarmism throughout the past 30 years. And on the other hand, you have the critics who said that this was a, created to control every aspect of your life. And they were starting with what you drive. Back then they wanted to get rid of the SUVs. Um, and But, you know, guys like Rush Limbaugh would say, that's where they're starting, but they're going to try to get to every aspect of your life. And so if you go back to what you drive, California in the last year has mandated that they will have all internal combustion engines off the road by, I think, 2030 or 2035, something like that. And I think every time that gets mentioned, it should be also mentioned that the week after they said that, they had rolling blackouts in the state of California, and no one was allowed to charge their electric cars. Um, but they also want to control how far you can travel. Um, in, they have what they call these 15-minute cities, and this is in the name of climate change, and they've actually tried to regulate this in, in places like London and Europe, in different places in Europe, where they put up cameras that monitor their citizens that make sure they're not traveling too far around the city or even driving to you know, older cars and things like that. And the citizens have cut the cameras down. Um, but there's also... Um, the CEO of Rabo Bank had said, she, she's on a video where she says that if you can't afford carbon offsets, you should not be allowed to fly. The only people that should be allowed to fly are those that can afford carbon offsets. And if you're too poor to fly and you want to travel, you should put on a virtual reality headset, and that's how you can see the world. Um, and if you want to hear more from Rabo Bank, they have a speaker at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association on Friday. So... You can buy your carbon offsets, fly down there, um, and listen to him. But um, they also want to control what you eat. And the New York City schools right now, they have taken meat off the menu for two, at least two days a week. And the New York City mayor has said that he is working on a plan where he will limit residents' ability to consume meat, um, start limiting the, the meat consumption of the city. He hasn't come out with how he's going to do that yet. But. Um, and then you have also, you know, ADM and Tyson right now are in the middle of building $500 million plants where they are going to grow insects for human consumption, all in the name of climate change. And they want your land. Biden's uh, 30 by 30 executive order, which a lot of you are familiar with, I think, um, conservation easements, and of course, eminent domain in this state. Um, where Summit Carbon, Summit Carbon Solutions has filed 80 separate eminent domain lawsuits against landowners in South Dakota. I think they're getting ready to in Iowa. Um, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, has said that the government should take away farmland and so that they, you, by using eminent do domain, the government should take away farmland so that they can uh, put up windmills. That's his suggestion all in the name of climate change. And so, you know, if you, those are the two scenarios. On the one hand, they've been wrong, and on the other hand, it seems they have been absolutely right. And if you think back to that teenager in my dad's shop who's wondering what the heck's going on, I've thought about, you know, if I could get in the DeLorean and go back in time and talk to him and tell him what happened, um, you know, the scenario that I just described, what he would say, and he would say, well, it's got to be over, right? Nobody's going to believe the liars after 30 years. And I would say, well, actually, if you question it, you're called a denier and a conspiracy theorist and a crazy person. Um, and he would say, how the hell did that happen? And I would say lies agreed upon. Because as I was looking through this climate change, uh, the... It's a mouthful. Partnership for Climate Change Commodities Project. Um, that's the quote that kept popping back into my mind, is lies agreed upon. And um, because that's I, what I feel like is the goal, is to get the last kind of link in the supply chain to agree to the lie. 
and, and allow them to control every aspect of your life. And that quote lies agreed upon. I like using quotes because um, I feel like it makes you feel, makes you sound smarter. Um, and I, I need all the help I can get. But um, I couldn't remember. I like I try to remember all these quotes I, so I can recite them, but I can, never can. And the lies agreed upon quote, I couldn't remember it. So I had to look it up, and um, the full quote is, history is a set of lies agreed upon. And I thought that painted with a pretty broad brush, but um, so I didn't use it. But what I found really interesting was who said it, and it was Napoleon. And um, Napoleon throughout history has always been thought of as a short guy. And I found that quote really interesting because there's this movie coming out, and with that, it was in the news that Napoleon actually wasn't short. Um, but it's been so thought of throughout the years, they call it, there's a Napoleon complex, which is if you're a short person, you try to do real big things with your life to compensate for your height. But the truth was Napoleon wasn't that short. He was actually 5'6", and the average man male height in the year 1800 was 5, five feet 5 inches. So he was an inch taller than the average male. And so how did the lie get agreed upon? Well, the Brits hated Napoleon, and there was a, one specific journalist named Gilray, and back then they didn't have pictures, so a lot of the illustrations, you know, a lot of the pictures in the newspapers were illustrations, and they used a lot of uh, political cartoons and satire. And this Gilray would always draw Napoleon as a short little guy throwing temper tantrums, and the lie was agreed upon for 225 years. And when Napoleon was dying on his deathbed, he said, Gilray did more than all the armies of Britain to bring me down. And so that kind of gives you an idea of who's best at getting the lies to be agreed upon. If you need lies to be spread, you go to the media. And when I first heard about this uh, Climate Smart Project, I was looking through it. I've been working on uh, doing different videos and writing about ESG during the, during the past year, and that is environmental social governance, and it's, it's really a plan that has been used to push lies throughout the supply chain, um, especially when it comes to agriculture. And so I wrote this article, and a lady uh, commented, she said, we applied for some of that pro uh, climate smart money, but they gave it all to the big corporations. And I thought, what the hell is this deal? You know, I had never heard of it. And so I started looking at it. Um, and I, was, I went to it, and I saw I was going through all the big corporations that they had given the $3 billion to. And the first one that really popped out to me was Farm Journal. And I thought, what the heck is this? And I, uh, you know, and I click on it. And a lot of the, the first project that came up, the, it was $5, $5 million. That's what the people got. And so I'm scrolling through, and I click on Farm Journal, and I see $40 million. Um, and I thought, what in the hell is this? But if you want to be a part of Farm Journal's Trust in Beef program, which is where the $40 million went to, you can put an EID tag or a tracking device in your calf's ear, and they will store all your information, all that, cow, all that animal's information. But then you put an app on your phone and you put all of the information about your operation into that app. How you to rotate your cattle, what you feed them, your land, soil, all that goes into the app. And then you download a software, another kind of software, and that's going to calculate your carbon emissions. And the way they sell this is they say they're, they're calculating the benefits of what you do. So if you rotate or if you feed certain things, they're going to measure your carbon emissions before and after and they're going to say that you're, you're calculating your benefits um, and how you're able to reduce those carbon emissions. And then you submit that info to, I assume, uh, either the USDA or whoever the USDA has paid $40 million to. That is the Farm Journal Trust and Beef Program. Um, and that is the same USDA that had John Kerry come and talk to them and tell them how agriculture is the number one uh, contributor to climate change. And so what do you think they're going to do with that information once they can control your entire operation and have all the measurements 
of carbon emissions from your entire operation, and you are the biggest contributor to climate change in the world, is what John Kerry said at the USDA meeting, they're going to control every aspect of your life. Um, and by doing these kind of things, I, one thing I think is really missed, um, Brett said there's people here talking about carbon credits, um, and one thing I think is really missed in this whole carbon credit deal is that when you do that, you're agreeing to the lie. Anything that involves carbon reduction or carbon credits or any of this stuff, you're agreeing to the lie. Um, and where the lie comes from goes back to who, the second quote I gave, the United Nations. They started the lie of cattle being bad for the environment, which is in 2006, they put out Livestock's Long Shadow, which is a gigantic report about um, how livestock are contributing, are the big, one of the biggest contributors to climate change. And over the years, I feel like we've laughed about the cow fart. You know, when you first heard about it, it was so funny. It was stupid because the cow farts were, you know, destroying the environment. And then we realized that, well, it's actually the cow burps, and that's not quite as funny, but it's still just as stupid, right? But now we, here we are. We're, there are ranchers signing up to have their carbon emissions measured and calculated. Um, and that is agreeing to the lie. Why would we ever need to have our carbon emissions calculated or measured if you didn't agree to that lie? Um, so back in 2006, they came, was Livestock's Long Shadow. In 2012, the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef was created. And that was really the beef industry's first agreement to the lie, or people in the beef industry, I would say. They couldn't wait to do it, it seems like. Um, and I'm not as familiar as with that, the Global Roundtable as uh, some of the people in here, but I just went to their website real quick and um, their executive director had a quote, um, the quandary facing us now is that we know the beef industry does not have to have a negative effect on the impact or climate biodiversity, but that it often does. And that's the organization that has, you know, all the major beef packers, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, um, I was talking last night, there's multiple state organizations. Iowa Cattlemen's is a uh, member of the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, which is the same messaging. Um, they are saying that the, um, the beef industry often has a negative effect on climate. They have obviously agreed to the lie. Um, and then around 2015, 2016, you had all four major beef packers uh, purchasing or investing in fake meat. The fake meat's big selling point was it was better for the climate. They kind of perpetuate the lie by investing in those companies and allow those companies to kind of, you know, that's giving them a bullhorn of talking about how beef is bad for the climate. Um, some people say National isn't invested in fake meat, but Marfrig is the majority owner of National and Marfrig is invested in plant-based. Um, and then you have uh, Cargill and JBS are both invested in cell-cultured meat and plant-based meat, and you have Tyson who is plant-based, cell-cultured, and now insects. Um, but if you come, uh, then you go to 2021 when you're coming off the worst cattle market years, a couple of the worst cattle market years with the Tyson fire and COVID, and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association said that their top priority um, after those years was sustainability. And they came out with their sustainability development goal to be net zero by 2040. And all of those terms, sustainability, sustainability development goal, um, and all that comes from the United Nations um, and their ESG plans and, and these reports, um, the same United Nations that predicted that the world would be unrecognizable by the year 2000. Um, and then we have now, um, in the last three years, this ESG has been pushed throughout um, all of the, all of the beef industry, all four major packers um, have their sustainability reports on their website. They have all agreed to the lie. Um, to, but to go back to this ESG, environmental social governance, um, and I told Brett, I, 
I thought, when I get to scope three, which is part of this ESG report, I feel like I kind of lose people, and I was thinking how, would, how to describe the scope three thing. And I thought, well, it's kind of, you have a colonoscopy. It's kind of the same thing with, with the scope. Like, I don't know why they named it scope three, and I think that might be part of, of where I lose people. But if you think about it, it's kind of like a, a rectal exam of your carbon emissions. Um, you, and that's where, what scope three is. When Tyson, when you did, Tyson Foods has a scope three part of their ESG report. And when you deliver cattle to Tyson, they want you to be able to report your carbon emissions. I think there is a plan in, there is a plan in place for you to have to do that. And that's part of ESG. Um, and if you read Tyson Foods ESG report, you will read, Tyson Foods will also refine scope three estimates and goals as supplier data and standardized methodologies for calculations across industry sectors become available. So supplier data, standardized methodologies for calculations across industry sectors become available. So if you go back to Farm Journal Stress and B program, supplier data, standardized methodology, and calculation. That's all what that is. They, Tyson Foods said that in 2020, the same year that the Climate Smart uh, Project came out, Tyson Foods, that is what was in Tyson Foods' ESG report. It's almost as if they went to USDA and said, this is what we need, or they maybe went to Farm Journal and said, this is what we need, and they created this exact system that would give Tyson Foods the ability to force you to report your carbon emissions when you deliver cattle, or when they buy cattle from anywhere. And the thing about scope three is it forces the next person to report their carbon emissions. So if you're a cow-calf guy and you're selling a feedlot who has to report his emissions to Tyson Foods, well then that feedlot is gonna say, we need your carbon uh, emission report, eventually. That's the plan. Um, and I thought I would bring in uh, part of the, the Climate Smart Projects. There's 131 of them, and I thought I had one here that would maybe hit a little closer to home for South Dakota. Here it is. South Dakota State University, um, as I was going through, this is their Climate Smart Project, and they are getting $80 million from the federal government for their Climate Smart Project. And part of this, Underneath that, and I, had, I didn't get into this much when I talked about it, because I don't completely understand it, but underneath that it says they are, their non-federal match is $81 million, $329,688. Um, Farm Journal's non-federal match was $400,000, and they were getting $40 million. Um, so I'll have to go to states. The amount they're getting is $80 million, and their non-federal match is $81 million. So, Seems to me they're getting 161 million dollars. I don't can't verify that because I'm not exactly sure how it works. But a lot of these partners that are involved in this, it will say that they're also they are also giving money. Um, they're uh, contributing, and so I don't know if people who contribute a few hundred thousand dollars to the Farm Journal program are they then getting a million dollars? I they they have it. It's much. It's a lot like the checkoff. They're moving all this money around. When you start with three billion, it's awfully hard to track. Um, but the show, the short summary of South Dakota State University's project is: it expands markets for climate smart beef and bison. Um, and to go back, um, climate smart beef, low carbon beef, any of that stuff that gets talked about. I remember when I first heard about it. Um, there's a ranch somewhere that decided he was going to be the first to create this low carbon beef. And what that is, is the first person to agree to the lie. Why would you need low carbon beef if cattle aren't destroying the environment? And I feel like it's gotten over the year, the past few years here, it's gotten so ingrained, like all this low carbon and carbon market, it's, it's just been agreed to, that, that it's needed. And that, oh, you know, people are excited that there might be this new market out here. But you're excited, what you're excited about is you're agreeing to that cattle are destroying the environment. Um, when you say those terms of climate smart beef and low carbon beef, you're agreeing to the lie. Um, and if you want to be part of those programs, that's what you're doing. 
but they're going to expand this project expands markets for climate smart beef and bison in I think nine different states tribes and supports farmers and ranchers with implementation and monitoring of climate smart practices um, all of these projects that I looked at have the same kind of language of monitoring that one says climate smart practices most of them will say greenhouse gas emissions if you look deeper you will see they have a section here that's called monitoring highlights the project will use Comet for calculating greenhouse gas emissions. Comet is um, an app or a software that was developed by USDA along with Colorado State University. And if you go to the Comet website, you can click anywhere in the world and you can click, put in what you're doing, like what form of agriculture you're doing. So if you're putting in cattle, you're raising cattle, and then we'll say, and then they will give you recommendations on how to reduce your climate if your carbon emissions if you're raising cattle and the two main um, recommendations they have are increase your rotations rotational grazing and reduce your herd so um, if you're rotating as much as you need to what's the next step if you're if you're not reducing your climate emissions enough what's the next step and the USDA, I believe, are going to use this Comet app to um, make a detailed map of, of the U.S. And so every county will have exactly what you need to do to reduce your carbon emissions. And every county could possibly have exactly how many cattle you need to have to have the right number of acceptable carbon emissions. Um, but to go on, so the project will use Comet for calculating greenhouse gas benefits. Smart Score AI will be used to develop software and warehouse and store data. Yardstick will also be used to measure soil profile, organic carbon, and bulk density. Sealock will measure and monitor greenhouse gas emissions from the beef and bison. Um, and if you go back to Tyson Foods, what they need for their ESG report, supplier data, standardized methodology for calculations across industry sectors. South Dakota State's getting $80 million to put this in place. Um, CLOC, to really bring this close to home, CLOC will measure and monitor greenhouse gas emissions from beef and bison. CLOC is a company that's located in Rapid City right down the street. And they are building machines that will measure the emissions that come out of your cattle. They have machines um, somehow. It seems pretty, I don't know. I don't know how accurate this could be or how they could even say that it's anywhere accurate, but they have machines you can put cake or feed into and your cow will come up and sit there and eat. And these machines will measure how, mu how much greenhouse gas emissions are coming out of the nostrils of your, of your animals. Um, and that's being done in Rapid City. And so the lie is really now, I believe, knocking at your front door. It has made it all the way through the entire cattle supply chain. Um, and there is one link left. And I believe that is the, uh, the independent farmer and rancher. And so i got a little mixed up here. Lost my place. <laughs> Got to digging for that climate smart project. Um, and so, there, um, legacy is talked about a lot in this industry. Um, we talk about generations and generations past and the generations coming. And um, I think right now our, we have a kind of a decision to make as far as legacy goes. Um, our legacy could be. Uh, filling up the land with windmills and solar panels and carbon pipelines and EID tags. Um, and we could be handing down ranches that are controlled by the federal government through carbon emission regulations. Um, but when I told my mother I was coming to do this deal, she said, well, I sure hope you have something positive to say. <laughs> and I said, you know what, you're right. And so... Um, I got to thinking about it, and when you get to digging into this stuff, it gets really overwhelming, and it's really easy to get down. When you see 
you, you know, when you look at the list of the people signed up on this thing and the people who have agreed to this lie, and it's every industry throughout agriculture, it's every almost every corporation throughout agriculture, um, is all talking about carbon now. And if, if you're talking about carbon, you've agreed to the lie. And so when I, over the years that I've been doing this deal, I've kind of realized that to, to try to stay positive and, and not get too down and not get too overwhelmed is I look at these things as opportunities. And so when you go back to talking about legacy, um, right, uh, our generation, I believe, uh, now has, a le how has the opportunity of leaving a legacy of standing up for the truth, rejecting the lies, and giving the next generation the opportunity to run their ranches with freedom, liberty, and independence. Um, in Iowa, there was this guy traveling all around the state a few weeks ago, and his name was Vivek Ramaswamy. And uh, at all the speeches, he would say, we are living in a 1776 moment. And that can, can sound kind of out there when I first heard it. I was like, well, I don't know if, if we're ready to pick up the muskets just yet. But um, I think when you look at it, I think he's right. Because what, I think what he means by that is you have the choice of, of giving into tyranny or standing up and, and taking the opportunity um, to stand up for freedom and truth and independence. And so that's what I wanted to come here today to say. Um, that's what the opportunity you've been given, and I think it'll really, um, over the next couple of years, that, that decision is going to have to be made by all of us. Thank you. Can somebody take a few questions? Does anybody have one? I'll get a microphone over to the edge. Throw it. Throw it? Jim, are you a carbon-based lifeline? <laughs> carbon See, I try to stay out of science of it all. <laughs> no, I learned this in the very very interesting house. Carbon is a golden bond of humanity. I just yeah. looked it up to make sure I was remembering that which one. I get that a lot on my comments and people say, carbon is the life, the whatever you just said, yeah. life form. I guess. Yeah. The building block of life. Carbon yeah. is the building block. Third grade, if I remember right. Yeah. But anybody have any questions for Jim? I think right. what he dives into is meant to make us feel stupid. That's what the whole episode <laughs> does, is to make it so complicated. Can you go into a little bit more detail about uh, the, the program that USDA set up that got all this stuff going? Yes. Um, and like Brett just said, it, it gets really complicated. Um, the program, I guess when you said it gets all this stuff going, the stuff was all going before USDA set it up. But it's called um, Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities Projects. It's $3 billion. Vilsack announced it, I think, September of 22. Um, and it is 131 different projects given um, tens of millions of dollars to the largest some of the largest corporations in agriculture. ADM, I believe is, I was looking up who the biggest corporations in agriculture is and I found a list where it said ADM is number two in the world. Um, but they're getting $90 million from USDA. Um, Nature Conservancy is getting, I believe, $60 million. Uh, I did, just did a video yesterday, Dairy Farmers of America is getting $40, 45000000 million. Um, and it's all the same, just what I read you there, um, U.S. Soybean Association is getting 90, or 95, I think they're the biggest. So they, it goes throughout all of agriculture. I kind of focused on cattle here today, but it goes throughout all of it. Um, and, you know, when you get into the grain stuff, it's how much your no-till is going to 
reduce your carbon or cover crops, things like that. And for the record, I'm for all of those things. My family has been using cover crops. We no till. We have intensive um, rotations. Um, you know, I I'm all for soil health and all of the things that you know, really the things that this program recommends. But the one thing I'm not for is having anything to do with reducing carbon emissions. Um, because when you do that, you're agreeing that you're destroying the planet, uh, which I just don't believe is happening. So. On that uh, $3 billion that was uh, allocated to this program, did that just come out of general fund? That was just a little sex idea. It came, um, the account is called Community, it's CCC, Community Commodity Corporation, something like that. And it's a fund mainly set up for um, relief for agriculture. Um, Trump used a lot of it during the COVID and trade regulations. Um, but what has happened? What what happened after Vilsack took that? Um, I think Grassley and another senator introduced a bill that would stop them from doing that without congressional oversight. He wanted that, at least it to go through the ag committee or something, um, because what this now is is um, Vilsack just took the money and handed it out to corporations, um, and and it hasn't been talked about near enough because. I mean, one of the corporations, Farm Journal, is the largest media company um, or agriculture media company in the country. And so I think it was kind of a, their idea to have them be definitely involved. Um, but to go a little more into it, a year after, so I found out about this a year after it was um, introduced, and a year later they said they had um, almost 1,500 people signed up. And they were hoping by around this time that they would have close to 2,000 people signed up. $3 billion. And they're hoping in a year and a half that they would have 2,000 people in agriculture signed up. I would think if they were paying more, I'm, I mean, I know some people that would definitely sign up if they were paying a lot, um, it's, which is unfortunate. But I mean, I, we all see the people want handouts. And, and unfortunately, there's a few of them in agriculture. You know, we continually uh, are pushed with this risk insurance and uh, different like things like that. There's always money to create another program to control us. However, when we come up with something like RCAP's come up with a machine petition, we uh, we're, we're not only not asking for money, we're that that program would probably make money for the federal government. And yet we can't get our people, our legislators and so forth, to support that kind of thing. How, how do we get it across to these people that we don't want the money, we want a fair shake? Well, I think that's probably a better question for the people coming next, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's hard for me to do these things because I, I look at them and I try to learn as much as I can and kind of see my my role as, as um, just hand, you know, kind of bringing you along to as what I'm learning because I'm not an expert about this. There's people in this room who have been doing this way longer than I have, um, and then have better ideas for solutions. Because at the end of it, I always feel like, well, I should, like my mom said, I should have something positive or or have a solution to the problem, um, and I don't. But you know, as far as this goes, you know, really my solution is overall. Agriculture cannot go along with this carbon deal. Um, you cannot agree to have your carbon emissions measured in any way, not their benefits or any, because what they want, like I read out of that Tyson Foods ESG report, what they want is your supplier data and a standardized way of calculating it. Because what do you think the next step is? They're going to want you to reduce it and reduce it and reduce it to the point where Germany, the Netherlands, we are seeing what the end result is. Jim, so if we call our member of Congress, what do we tell them? Yeah, I, I would like to have done more work on that bill a 
about that Grassley had. I don't think it stops the money. Um, I think the money's already gone. If you go to the, the USDA, um, when I started looking at this, it was at 2.98 billion. Um, when Grassley first introduced it, he said he had 3.2 billion available, and now it's at 3.01 billion. So <laughs> I think it's pretty much gone. Um, but I don't know, Bill. I mean, maybe that's that's a better question for you to for you to come up with. I'm not as good at, at talking to politicians as, or you know have as much experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, just the, the ability for them to stop taking money and handing it out to get people to calculate this stuff would be a step. But yeah, this one seems like it's kind of out of the barn. We got we got to wrap it up, Jim. But one last question: You are not following the herd. You're swimming against the stream. Where do we find what you do? How do we support you? Because Jim and I have talked about this. This is not like superficial. This is it takes a lot of lot of time to go down that hole and come back up and try to bring something with you. And, and he said, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to <laughs> fund myself. So I'm just being oh. transparent that we've had this conversation. I mean, it, it's no different than stock growers having to charge dues or RCAF. It <laughs> takes time and it takes money. So how, first, where do we find you? And second, how do we help support what you do? Yeah, so my website is called Lonesome Lands. And you can find that on all the social media. Um, and Brett's talking about it. An idea, you know, after I did this Climate Smart deal, I spent a ton of time. I think I told him I was working on it in October, and that was during harvest, and, and we were weaning and different things going on, and um, I think the article came out in December. So um, the amount of time, and, and it just takes a lot of time to connect these dots. If I'd have came out with it right away, I'd said, you know, this is BS that the federal government's given Farm Journal $40 million. I wouldn't have been able to connect the dots with ESG and all the different things if I didn't take some time. Um, and so what I've done is I put together a subscriber page um, because my main thing, I have a couple goals. I don't want to ask for handouts or, or you know, what the subscriber page is is kind of a donation, but I've, I've always not wanted to have a donation, and I also don't want to... Um, to, to be controlled by advertisers. Um, and so I put this page together similar to other websites where, but I also, I guess the other thing I wanted to do is always keep all the information free, completely free, not behind a paywall. Um, and so there's a way you can go, you can go to the subscriber page and I have different options, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, 60 bucks a year, 120 bucks a year. And that is just how you kind of how you help me keep doing this. Um, when I started Lonesome Lands, the goal was, the reason it's not jimmundorf.com is because the goal is to continue to build it and bring other people in. And I've had other people come and write. Um, right now, it's just kind of me. But um, if, I can, if I can keep the ball rolling, it's, it's something I'd really like to do and turn into a legitimate business. <laughs> right now, it's kind of a side thing. But that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate that.